When all else fails, they take you to war. So said US Trends forecaster Gerald Chalenti this week. And not for the first time. Chalenti describes himself as a political atheist, and I've taken that for my own, as well as his line about war. I used to say I was politically homeless, but to be homeless implies a desire for a home somewhere. But I will never look to politics or politicians for a home of any sort. Not now, and perhaps never again. An atheist says there's no God, and a political atheist knows politics is the mother of all confidence tricks. When it comes to politics, there's nothing there. Chalenti was a guest this week of George Galloway, MP, on his online Mother of All talk shows. Galloway talked about the Hoor's Den that is the Palace of Westminster. Recently returned to the Mother of All Dunghills as MP for Rochdale, he must hold his nose whenever he stands to speak and so breathe the fetid air of the Chamber of the Commons. He endeavoured to have his colleagues contemplate the Third World War already well underway. We're not supposed to have noticed World War III is up and running. Generations remembering what they've been invited to know of World War II, the stuff of movies now, think it will only be a real war when the bombs fall on their cities, when the young men are marched away. But make no mistake, I say, World War III is already here. The difference is that since the nuclear option is among us, the warmongers who have no intention of getting their windows broken or their limousines scratched, far less seeing a threat to their vast wealth, are carefully waging World War III in ways they think the little people won't notice. For the time being, the warmongers in the UK Parliament and in the broader establishment seek to reap the rewards of all the hate they've sown via bought and paid for media, via bought and paid for elected representatives. For those people and regimes we've been goaded into viewing with nothing but loathing. Right now, courtesy in no small part of our unelected Foreign Secretary David Cameron and our unelected PM Rishi Sunak, Israel and Iran are at daggers drawn. Israel bombed the Iranian consulate in Damascus, and so Iran retaliated having first informed Israel and the White House of their intention to do so. British and US jets took part in the defence of Israel, helping to prop up the US-made Iron Dome that protects that nation. Even so, and despite the world's media insisting that Iranian attack had been thwarted, most of its ballistic missiles struck Israel's Nevatim Air Base, one of the most determinedly defended spaces on the planet, with the consent and support of the British and US governments, Israel vowed to strike back. There have already been reports of Israeli retaliation. As George Galloway pointed out this week, Israel is a nation with 3 million fighting age people, compared to Iran's 40 million. Hundreds of nuclear weapons are in the offing. Israel has the full-throated support of Britain and the United States. Iran has the support of China and Russia, bristling with nuclear weapons. Israel has long maintained the Samson option, a biblical vow to unleash nuclear war if and when the nation is in danger of being overrun. Samson, for the atheists out there, was the Old Testament Israelite who brought the temple down upon his sorry head and upon the heads of his Philistine tormentors when all was lost. Mutually assured destruction, if you will. Fires of war stoked in the Middle East Biblical intent, buy-in from the most bellicose nations on earth and all the superpowers, more than enough nuclear weapons, in theory at least, to kill every last one of us on the planet and all of it being provoked and egged on by political pygmies and psychopaths. What could possibly go wrong? So I say again, repeating Gerald Chalenti's words, war is where they take you when all else fails. And all else is indeed failing for those psychopaths, the inevitable evolution of the parasite class we have stood by and enabled. They've utterly exposed themselves and their intentions in recent years, what with the so-called scamdemic and their money laundering proxy war in Ukraine and the ever-present nonsense of what I like to call a climate hoax, even sacrificing the well-being of children on the altar of gender identity a warped ideology exposed for what it is in recent days, wasn't enough to satisfy whatever gods they worship. And so war it is, Third World War, 
which has hardly touched us in the West so far, other than in our pockets and wallets, of course, but there's time yet. They didn't mean to let us see them, but by hubris and the pursuit of obscene wealth and total control that seemed within their grasp, this generation of psychopaths and parasites pushed their luck too far. Tragically, there's nothing new in any of it. The Wall Street crash of 1929 and the Great Depression that followed in the 1930s was the work of an earlier generation of bankers. I said bankers who bought from supine politicians the power to make money out of thin air. In 1930s America, there was no shortage of goods and services, industrial capacity, rich farmland, millions of workers keen to work, all the technology of the day, government structures with enviable capacity to get done whatever it wanted done. 1930s America had known no invasion by a foreign aggressor, no disease had weakened the people, there was no shortage of food. 1930s America lacked one thing and one thing only, and that was ready cash to get on with the stuff of busy lives. But in 1930s America, as in the rest of the world now, the flow of money was controlled by one entity and one entity only, a cartel of bankers, bankers who for their own reasons turned off the money supply. All those businesses still had loans to service though, jobs waited to be done, the same goods and services were available. But when the banks, in the form of the so-called Federal Reserve, which is not federal in any way, but a private company run by and for bankers for profit and only profit, and that holds no reserves, when the bankers turned off the money supply, the US came to a juddering halt, as was their intention. The so-called Great Depression was made by bankers for their own ends. All those farms and homes and businesses suddenly rendered unable to function or to service their loans, were repossessed by the bankers. Everyone was told times were hard, we're all in this together, but the only thing the bankers were in was baths full of profit. Come World War II, and all at once, banks that had spent a decade claiming they had no money found uncountable billions of dollars overnight to pay for bombs and bullets and the ships, tanks and planes to fire them. In the Commons this week, they laughed nervously perhaps, at George Galloway, an actual thinking man of conscience among empty-headed nobodies, those political pygmies being the vast majority of our elected and unelected sock puppets. It was shaming to watch the spectacle as hollow non-entities preferred to talk about Liz Truss's memoirs and Angela Rayner's council house than to address what Galloway wanted to discuss, being bloody war set to envelop the world among much that bamboozles me now is why we keep interviewing those wastes of space we call MPs. So-called reporters still asking them questions, straight-faced, when their time might be better spent asking fleas about the decisions likely to be taken by the horse they're sucking blood from. They won't talk about war, at least not until they've been handed the latest script from whoever tells them what to say. Dennis Healy, a ghost from a bygone age, said MPs needed a hinterland, by which he meant they had to have more going on in their lives than just preening in Parliament like peacocks, but with smaller brains than peacocks. Part of our tragedy now is that the House of Commons is, with a handful of exceptions, filled with people who know nothing about anything and care less. That's true not just here in the UK, but of politicians across the West. I say those characters, or rather those creatures devoid of character, are bought and paid for, serving only the transnational corporations, the non-governmental organisations of the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organisation and what have you, and the bankers who call the shots. I say international terrorism, as we've been taught to fear it, and the war on terror is a mirage, a straw man. I say terrorism is waged on us not by foreign insurgents, but on the contrary by those we, the collective we of the West, have accepted as leaders, those for whom public fear of terror works wonders at the ballot box, and when it comes to winning approval for wars overseas, wars of profit and regime change. It's plausible there's been genocide in Gaza. The International Court of Justice said so. It also seems to me just as it has been revealed to many in recent months that the decision makers of the West have no ethical moral problem with genocide as policy. I say they don't object to genocide per se, despite what some of us learned at school about the horrors of the 20th century. I say it boils down to whether the genocide is happening to people they think worth saving or those they believe don't matter. And here we are at war again, where they take you when all else fails. 
maybe by accident rather than by design, the nuclear birds will someday take wing. But I say again, it seems unlikely to me that those feckless, greedy ghouls in power in the banks and elsewhere truly mean to face Armageddon. Far from it. That would take backbone and will, in both of which most are profoundly lacking. Fear is what they always sell us, and fear is what they're selling us now. And while fear is in the air rather than missiles headed for London and Washington, those bankers can get about the business of reaping the rewards of financial and economic collapse that might destroy us, but that will enrich and empower them, as it always does. As likely as not, it won't be mushroom clouds we have to contemplate, but programmable CBDCs and the shackling digital IDs to go along with them. Here's the thing. French philosopher and writer Joseph de Mestre said, every nation has the government it deserves. If that's true, and we truly deserve that which we have, then God forgive us and God help us. I'm joined this week by the Chair of Republicans Overseas UK, Greg Swenson. As always, it's great to see you, Greg. Great to be here, Neil. It seems to me in general that there's this febrile, high temperature atmosphere in the world. Yeah. It, 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 are we to find, are we to be given a cool head anywhere in Washington, in London? I, I don't think we're seeing it in Washington. Um, you, pr you might see it in some of the diplomatic circles. You might see it in, even in some of the military circles. But do, President Biden has been really inconsistent on this. And it seems that Rishi and, and Cameron have basically followed his lead. So when Joe Biden says, take the win, which it wasn't a win, it was a, it was a successful defense, but it surely wasn't a win. Or, you know, uh, use some discretion or, you know, keep it in proportion. Those, it's just inconsistent. So, so President Biden, on, you know, one day he says, we're going to support Israel with whatever it takes. And the next day he says, we don't want you to do this. We don't want you to do that. We don't want you to finish the, finish the job. So I think there is some inconsistency. The other thing I should point out is there are good guys and bad guys. And I would argue that Iran are the bad guys. And yes, their, their uh, embassy was attacked in Damascus. But is it really an embassy when you're housing the IRGC regional headquarters? When Trump was able to take out General Soleimani, he did it, granted, he was driving in a caravan and, and he happened to catch him on the highway. Good for him. But I don't think the Israelis had that option. I think they're, you know, the IRGC has maybe smartened up since Soleimani was taken out. So Given there, what's there happening, to, yeah. given what's been happening sure. in Gaza, does Israel still hold its head up as the good guy? Yeah, I think they do because they're, they're keeping, you know, in, in spite of some of the media criticism of, of, of the Israelis. It's not media they, criticism. They, the ICG said there's grounds for plausible genocide, which is a big word. I, I think that's a stretch because, the, you know, th this is on Iran and this is on uh, Hamas for using their people as human shields. I'm quite sure that Iran doesn't care about Palestinians, Palestinians dying. They managed to keep their own weapons and nuclear facilities separate from, you know, far from their population centers, which is wise. But, you know, this is a this I think it really comes down to deterrence versus appeasement. And, I, and Biden has been classic at appeasement for a very long time, going back 50 years, actually. He was very against the, the Reagan Strategic D Defense Initiative, which has ultimately created Iron Dome. And these are defensive measures. So, mm -hmm. you know, his criticism of Reagan was was in 1986, and he's been pretty consistent ever since in being much more likely to appease in, and cross his fingers and hope that things work out. Well, that hasn't really worked out. So I think it's time for the restoration of deterrence, and I think the Israeli strike last night might have been the beginning of that. Uh, and why, why the UK is agitating for war when our armed forces would fit in a football stadium is beyond me. But Good we'll continue point. this conversation. After the break, which is already upon us, I'll be joined by a former UK ambassador to discuss if we are sleepwalking towards World War III. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Don't go away. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Is there a serious risk of us all stumbling into World War III? A vital and unfortunately pertinent question. Joining me now is the former UK ambassador to Uzbekistan, Craig Murray. Craig, thanks very much for joining me. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Neil. How dangerous, Craig, is the situation as it now sits uh, between 
Israel and Iran? Well, it's obviously extremely dangerous because, in effect, you have a a state of war existing between the two. They are uh, attacking each other's territory. Um, so, you know, the questions of of legality of actions don't really apply anymore. In in that, all that governs the actions now are the are the laws of war. Fortunately, um, Iran appears to be indicating it's not going to. Uh, retaliate uh, against this later Israeli strike. Of, of, of course, um, there's no way of being 100% certain that's how it's going to play out. And there's also the danger that Israel, if Iran doesn't retaliate, will do something else, because it, it's very much been in Israel's interest to start this um, uh, major escalation with, with Iran, because it stopped people talking about Gaza. Uh, and it's released the, the pressure, at least in the view of politicians, it's removed the pressure on arms exports to Israel, although uh, a great many people don't see it that way. It, it feels as though there's a, a, just a complete absence of cool-headedness anywhere. You know, traditionally, I would have expected where there was a flare-up of, of aggression in the Middle East, that the, the, it would have been the role of the President of the United States to try and pour uh, the oil of peace onto that. Uh, and on, but on the contrary, at the moment, all we seem to have in the West, in the UK and in Washington, uh, is it, what feels like a general agitation for war somewhere all the time. I think that's absolutely correct. I, I, I think that's a, a spot on analysis. Uh, and there are a couple of things to remember there. What, one of which is, of course, some people make money out of war. Uh, the, the armaments industry has done extremely well, uh, and there's a tremendous um, go-round between the armaments industry and uh, politicians. Um, and also uh, Netanyahu himself, of course, uh, stands to lose power as uh, still soon as, uh, as soon as peace breaks out. He, he's liable to be out on his ear as prime minister and facing uh, potential jail time over these corruption cases which are suspended at the moment. So um, the, the difficulty we have is that we have people in power who have an interest in, in war. And when you know when you hear of these amazing sums of money, like you know, $39 billion more for the war in Ukraine from the United States or uh, $19 billion for Israel, that's all real money. It's getting spent. And, and along with that, go go over various forms of kickbacks, legal and illegal, to the politicians who pass the money. War, war is a device for recycling money from the people who pay for it uh, into the, the hands of people who govern us. Greg Swenson, how do you react to that? You know, war's a device for yeah, laundering I, money back into the hands I, of I'm those not, that I'm pay. not that cynical about it. I mean, the reality is we need defence, and the best way to... Pre- the best way to avoid war is to prepare for war. And I, I know I'm, I'm trying to make this, you know, sort of deterrent argument uh, from the 1980s. Maybe I'm a little outdated, but it, it is true that the U.S. and the U.K. spend way too much money on entitlements, which is not the, the proper role of the federal government or the na- national government. The proper role of the, na- of the government is to maintain the currency and to defend the borders, defend the country. And so if that requires armaments, and you go to the private sector, the arsenal of democracy, to get those armaments, that's just the, the real world. I'm sorry. I, I don't know how else it could be done. But what, what, is, what is business and war for profit? I, I suppose it's always been that way, but the, it being so nakedly exposed now, I find uh, pr- profoundly troubling. Uh, uh, Craig, has Israel's standing in the world been altered for the foreseeable future? You know, I, I was sort of reared in a world in which Israel was a good guy is how it was sold to us. But it, it no longer seems to have the, the, the right to, uh, to hold its head up in that way at the moment. What do you think? Well, I think it's true. Uh, I think people like you who traditionally perceived Israel as the, as the good guy have changed their mind. I, that's, that's undoubtedly true. The opinion polls are, are, are startling and absolutely Remarkable. The last one I saw had 71% of the UK tend to support Palestine as opposed to tend to support Israel, 71%. And uh, that would have been a majority for Israel 
two years ago. Um, so I, I think there's been a fundamental shift. I, I mean, there's, uh, uh, I was present in the courtroom of, at The Hague for the genocide case um, between South Africa and, and Israel. And I, I've no doubt that what's happening is a, a genocide and people, people see it on their mobile phones every day. People see the dreadful, dreadful things that are, that, that, that are happening. And so um, the public have tired of, of Israel and are not prepared to put up with this kind of atrocity. And the fascinating thing is, of course, that, that support for Israel has become a kind of membership qualification for, for joining the political class. To, to be a respectable politician, you are supposed to be a Zionist. Um, and that's now completely out of favor of the public. So in, in, in most democracies, you have both the governing party and the major opposition party being staunchly pro-Israel, and the people <laughs> completely rejecting that in the light of what's happening in Gaza now. I've heard it said, which is, which is even more... Uh, astonishing in some ways. I've heard it said recently that that Israel is losing the war. That I I in the ways that matter, Hamas are winning the war. You, you've got you've got Palestinians vowing and and actively returning to the rubble of their former of their former homes. Uh, but but what do you make of that? that? Is it even possible that that Israel doesn't actually have the upper hand? I think militarily, Israel is bound to have the upper hand in that, you know, it's not actually a war. This is a massacre. You can't have a war against a population which does not have an army, does not have a navy, and does not have an air force. It's not, this is not a war. This is a massacre of, of an essentially unarmed people with, with a very small number of light and homemade weapons uh, facing a, a very modern technologically equipped army which is massacring them. So you can't militarily win in those situations. But of course, um, Israel is trying by, by bombs to defeat ideas. And you can't defeat ideas. You can't defeat a, a people's aspiration for freedom by, by bombing them. So uh, it, it was bound to fail. It, it, it could never succeed. You could never eradicate um, a Palestinian uh, resistance by this kind of, of 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 warfare, and of course, we all know. I, and, and I'm sure, Neil, if you know, if members of your family were, were bombed to death, particularly children, you would be radicalized, and, and the Palestinians are going to be even more radical after this. Plus, Israel has lost the hearts and minds of the people of the Western world and of the governments of of the rest of the world. So. Um, uh, yes, it, it's a disaster for Israel. It, it's a complete disaster. A complete disaster for Israel. Th thank you so much for joining us from uh, from Lahore in Pakistan, uh, Craig Murray. Uh, and, but I will certainly take away from that your your uh, your point that you can't bomb ideas. Uh, you can't make ideas go away with bombs. But thank you so much for making time for us this evening, Craig Murray, former diplomat, UK diplomat for Uzbekistan. Another break. And then we'll be joined by the co-founder of Thoughtful Therapists to discuss the bombshell CAS report, the CAS review, and also the comments made recently by Sir Chris Whitty. This is The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Is the trans debate too vitriolic? Uh, those were the words of Sir Chris Whitty, Chief Medical Officer, following the release of the bombshell CAS review. T to discuss all of this, I'm joined now by author and co-founder of Thoughtful Therapists, James Esses. Good evening, James. Thanks for making time for us. Hi there, Neil. James, it, it's, there's no other way to describe it, is it? Bombshell. It's damning stuff uh, that's been uh, that's been brought to the to, to the fore by paediatrician Dr. Hilary Cass. How did we get here? Yes, uh, it, it, it was a bombshell report. 
Um, although it didn't really tell us anything we didn't already know ourselves, if we're going to be completely honest. You know, we, we, we already knew that children who felt that they were born in the wrong body were suffering from a, me- a mental health condition. You know, we, we already knew that artificially uh, blocking a, a child's puberty might cause them harm in the long run. But nonetheless, I'm very happy to see it set out once and for all in black and white. I mean, we got here over many, many years of slow infiltration of this ideology into all of our societal institutions. I mean, the Cass Review focused very much on NHS gender clinics, but that's without even considering the way in which, for example, Stonewall has infiltrated government departments. Uh, you know, ideologies infecting what children are being taught in schools, being taught that, you know, if they don't conform to traditional sex stereotypes, that they might actually be in the wrong body. Um, even the media choosing to sometimes promote or, or glorify uh, medical transitioning. So this has come at us from all angles, and it's happened very slowly over the years, almost kind of beneath the radar. And it's only now that society as a whole is starting to wake up to the horrors that have been caused in the name of this ideology. It seems to me, James, that it's a bit late in the day for the for someone with this with this the status of chief medical officer to say that the you know that the treatment's got ahead of the evidence. You know, I mean, after all, you'd think that we pay what we pay for the National Health Service on the understanding that it will be evidence-based treatment that people get, uh, children, uh, perhaps more importantly than for anyone else. Precisely. And, and, and again, similar to the CAS review, you know, I was very pleased to hear Chris Whitty make that statement. However, it is unfortunately far too late. Many, many children have already been harmed in the process and the NHS should never have been offering quote unquote treatment. I mean, I'm not sure I can even call it treatment, um, actually. I'm going to call it experimentation. Uh, The NHS should never have been offering this stuff when the evidence was not there to back it up. But again, we're living in such strange times in which people are coming out with what we always took for granted as the most kind of basic statements and we're now kind of applauding them as kind of revolutionaries. You know, I still remember uh, when Boris Johnson stood out and said that uh, women cannot have a penis. I mean, you know, the fact that that even needed to be said in the first place tells us just how far we've sunk. Indeed. Uh, Greg Swenson, this idea, you know, that you can be born in the wrong body, it it astonishes me that in the face of 20th and 21st century biology, that that healthcare would, would settle somehow upon an idea so... Uh, 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 oh, yeah. It's outrageous, and I'm with both of you. It, it's about time. Now, should we have needed the CAST report? That, you know, Dr. CAST has done a great job, and I think she's done us a, a great service. But again, it's stating the obvious, and the fact that the NHS was doing this without, without really researching, or without any scientific evidence. What happened to follow the science, which was the favorite calling cry of the, of the left? back in 2020 and 21. And, but it was the same thing with the scam around ma- vaccine mandates and mask mandates and school closures. It's, it was done without scientific evidence. James, is it part of a, a bigger issue in a sense that w- what we have here is the state uh, putting itself in between parent and child, mm-hmm. you know, taking on some kind of parental role Putting, its, putting itself first in that decision-making position rather than the actual natural parents. We, we, we do see a lot of that, unfortunately. You know, I, I've recently written some pieces on various NHS trusts and their uh, quote-unquote transgender policies. You know, and they will put out statements that say, for example, that um, even if a family is not on board with the notion of their child transitioning and using different pronouns and names, that the clinicians should go along with the child's wishes against the views of the parents. Similarly, you know, we've seen this in schools. I mean, it's been quite horrifying to see that there have been schools colluding with vulnerable children behind their parents' backs and facilitating and enabling them to socially transition at school. Um, I, I mean, it's an absolute disgrace. Greg, I, that, that word, horror, horrifying, that's how I feel as a parent. Yeah. The very suggestion 
that some state myrmidon would get right. between me and my child and make decisions they, for that child that I don't even get to know about. They love being the nanny state. They want to be the, they want to, this happened eight years ago in the States with, you know, the Obama method of, you know, from birth to death that, you know, we will look after you. We, the great state of experts, will look after you. It's absolutely insane. And the, I'm, I'm so glad to see the pushback at a national level in the UK before the US. It's driving the people, the progressives in the US are going crazy right now because they always look to Europe as the ultimate, you know, social welfare state. And now they're disappointed that, that Europe or the UK specifically is leading the charge on this. So good, good for the UK, good for Dr. Cass. And it's happening in the red states, by the way. It started happening two or three years ago, I'm but glad, not in the blue states. That's I'm glad it's happening somewhere in the states. James, do you think we'll see accountability? I mean, I'm always after accountability in, in so many areas, but you know, there's, we, we know without a doubt that there, are, that there are children, young people out there who, who uh, have come forward to say that they've been damaged, that they've been let down, uh, that, uh, whatever. Do you think we'll see anyone held accountable? I certainly hope so, but I'm, I'm not convinced. I mean, we really need to get to grips with uh, figuring out exactly how we as a society and how the government allowed this ideology to infiltrate the institutions that it did. And, you know, I don't think the cast review is enough in that respect. You know, increasingly there are calls for something like a national public inquiry. Um, so I would say watch, watch this space on that. But yes, people do need to be held to account. And, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again, that those clinicians who have caused irreversible damage to these children in the name of an ideology, I believe that they should be struck off the medical medical register. And more than that, I believe that they should be charged and ideally imprisoned because this is nothing more than child abuse. A very straight answer to a straight question. Thanks mm -hmm. very much, James Esses. Thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, in response to the CAS review, uh, an NHS spokesperson said, and I quote, the NHS has made significant progress towards establishing a fundamentally different gender service for children and young people in line with earlier advice by Dr. Cass and following extensive public consultation and engagement by stopping the routine use of puberty suppressing hormones and opening the first of up to eight new regional centres delivering a different model of care. We will set out a full implementation plan following careful consideration of this final report and its recommendations. And the NHS is also bringing forward its systemic review of adult gender services and has written to local NHS leaders to ask them to pause uh, offering first appointments at adult gender clinics to young people below their 18th birthday. End quote. Another break, I'm sad to say, uh, after which I'll be chatting to two experts about how the desert kingdom of Dubai has been hit with flooding. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. You may have recently been asking yourself just precisely what is cloud seeding and is it to blame for the floods in the UAE, in Dubai to be precise. Uh, to discuss this, I'm joined by author and journalist GP Taylor, Graham Taylor, and Professor of Meteorology at the University of Reading, Professor Martin Ambaum. Uh, gentlemen, to both of you, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, Graham, if I can come to you first, um, what did, as far as you were concerned, what happened in Dubai? Well, I, I picked up this story because I was concerned what was happening to Yorkshire farmers who were uh, complaining heartily that uh, this year's harvest might be affected due to heavy rainfall. And when I started doing some research, I found that um, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates were running an extensive program of what was called cloud seeding, where aircraft would go up into clouds and release salt, so my I think it is, and various other things, uh, in an attempt to cause rain. They'd already said that uh, this might have affected the weather in back in January, where there'd been flooding. And uh, according to sources, um, this is what happened prior to the, the flooding in um, the recent days. However, I've noticed today that uh, a lot of news sources were saying that um, the cloud seeding had little effect on the storm. I noticed this sort of kicked in straight away, that as soon as people thought 
cloud seeding was to blame. Suddenly, it's not to blame. It's climate change. The usual story is just trotted out that it's climate change. This is a story that the Yorkshire Post covered on Wednesday and got a significant amount of interest in that uh, there was worried that cloud seeding was behind this. And my research, my own research and things that I've um, I've witnesses uh, is implicating that this is going on worldwide. It's not just in um, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and it may be a problem with um, the weather that we're seeing at the moment. Let me pause you there, Graham. Professor Ambom, uh, same question to you, really. How do you assess uh, the truth and the reality of what unfolded in Dubai? Well, the event we had over last Tuesday was a large mesoscale weather system, mesoscale convective system. It was uh, predicted several days in advance, pro probably more than a week in advance. A uh, day in advance, people knew that there would be more than a year's worth of rainfall uh, occurring from this mesoscale weather system. And uh, the authorities in the Emirates warned people to stay at home during that day and they closed schools for the day. So it was a well-predicted system. It's, it was just a weather system. There is, um, these weather systems occur with some regularity in the area. I have, um, I have Professor, though. I've read, I've read elsewhere that, um, that the UAE uh, dispatched cloud seeding planes from mm. Al Ain airfield uh, yeah. for seven missions across a two-day period, I think Monday and Tuesday of the week. And yet, right, so, well, so that was so that was happening at the same time. So people are bound to, uh, you know, uh, it's you yeah, know can... it's not necessarily proof, but people would be bound to draw the conclusion that cloud seeding may have played a part. Yeah. Okay. That's perhaps people who don't know too much about what cloud seeding actually does. I mean, I should. Can I just say that um, the Emirates run an operational cloud seeding operation they fly about 300 they, uh, they 300 fly, uh, missions a year so it's it's happening all the time um, they what they attempt to do is in uh, arid regions to get uh, convective clouds to produce a bit more rain now they know and everybody who works on cloud seeding knows that the effects are hard to measure they are limited in scope and limited in time scale. So um, any, any basic physics underlying cloud seeding uh, indicates that, um, that these effects occur on the time scale of, you know, within an hour or something like that. Um, so, and then we have a mesoscale weather system here with um, an amount of energy of many, many, you know, Hiroshima level atomic nuclear weapons going off at the same time. Uh, to assume that cloud seeding uh, operations could have any influence on, on this, on the evolution of such a massive system, a system I should uh, emphasize again, that had been predicted days in advance. So the Emirates, they go cloud seeding to get rain over their arid regions. They will not go out cloud seeding when they have, uh, in order to make very heavy rain, even worse. I and the, and we, as far as we have been told by our contacts in the uh, in the Emirates, uh, they did not fly during that in that particular event. And obviously, there was never a reason to fly during the event. Graham, clearly, we've got we've we've got here two. You know, you're either side of me there, um, diametrically opposed assessments of, of oh. what has happened. Well, let me explain, Neil. It, they run one thousand seeding operations per year. That's their own information, commonly available uh, from their website. They also say, and boast quite brightly, that they are going to get 3.5 million cubic meters of water have already fallen due to their cloud seeding operations. Information that I found said that uh, cloud seeding operations were conducted into this storm. And also, if I can remind the learned professor about a storm that occurred in this country in 1952 with op Operation uh, Cumulus, which was an RAF operation to seed clouds, where a, a rainfall happened in Dorset and, a, and a, the town of Lidma, I think it was, it endured such horrific flooding that I think 30 people died. And when they found out that this had happened, 
after the cloud seeding had taken place, the operation was stopped. So I think people are right in thinking that uh, cloud seeding had an effect on this. And and to be frank with you, I, I, I really have stopped believing this government narrative that's being pushed out that cloud, cloud seeding doesn't uh, affect the atmosphere and causes significant rain. I think it does. Professor, do you do you understand why there's so much interest? I'm sure, like, perhaps you haven't, but I, I certainly see a great deal of speculation online, uh, on social media, people posting photographs of you know of the sky, you know, blue one minute, you know, and grey an hour later, and so on and so. On. Do do you empathise at all with people having concerns oh, no. about what's no, going I, on? I, look. Uh, people speculate uh, about stuff all the time, but it's a bit of a shame that it is always done out of a position of, of, of quite a lot of ignorance sometimes. Look, when you don't know what's happening, that doesn't mean something bad is happening, right? So um, the Linmouth floods are indeed an, an example that are being trotted out all the time. Of course, the, as I don't know the details. Uh, I. I uh, in 1952, I wasn't around, but uh, as far as I'm aware, the seeding occurred in, a, in, a di in an area different from where the flooding occurred. Um, and, and, and I would have thought indeed that uh, people realized around that time that there was a bit of a, a you know, public opinion disaster, really, in the sense that they, I think they first denied that cloud seeding happened, but then, of course, uh, cloud seeding did happen. And probably that was because uh, in those days, uh, the RAF uh, did cloud seeding and they probably treated it as some sort of uh, quasi secret that, or something. Hold that thought, But, the, but of course, the, 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 um, there is no secret in the cloud seeding operations that are done uh, that are done in the no, Emirates. No secret. It's hold a, hold a that well thought. Well-publicized thing, and you will oh. realize that that in the Emirates they will, of course, for their own political reasons, make sure that um, their achievements are um, oh. are. Um, just uh, just, as just, much while, as possible. just while I still have you both, I'd like to turn also yeah, to Greg on. Swenson here in the studio. Greg, you can be something of an adjudicator, I suppose. You know, having heard the having heard the the testimony there, and I'm I'm sure you've got your own opinion about this. Do, are you are you interested as I am in the level of general interest in the wider public that has that has, yeah, it's that fascinating. has risen it's, like a storm cloud around this? Yeah, topic? and and it's really interesting listening to these these two scientists because. Nobody really in the general public even knew that cloud seeding was occurring. And if they did, it was rare and unusual. Whereas both have said that the United Arab, the, the UAE and the Saudis have been doing it fairly consistently. Now, it's interesting that one source says 300 times a year and another says 1,000. Uh, but, but it is, you know, it, it is, there is potential misinformation coming out of this, and it's really interesting to see. I definitely agree with, with Graham that uh, no surprise that the climate alarmists came in and, and, and blamed the existential crisis, as usual. Uh, thank you to, thank you to uh, for the moment, Graham Taylor and uh, Professor Ma uh, Martin Ambaum. Thank you. Uh, th this is a, a topic that fascinates me, but we'll, uh, we'll park that at the moment, and I have to move on. But thank you both for your uh, illuminating contributions. Good evening. Welcome to the second hour of the Neil Oliver Show. How lucky are we? Uh, it is a chance to have longer, more relaxed, more in-depth conversation, uh, which I very much enjoy with my guests. I was just talking to Greg Swenson uh, the, uh, of uh, Republicans Overseas UK. We were discussing the fact that there's so much to discuss at the moment, so many topics that it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, so thank goodness that we've got the extra time to, uh, to give some air time to uh, considering just what's going on in the world around us. I'll be chatting to researcher Caroline Corum, who believes chemtrails are a real thing. Now, chemtrails, that's a couple of words that we've all learned to ponder in recent times. Chemtrails, whatever they are, they could be a massive threat to our skies, and I'm looking forward to knowing more about it. I'll be chatting as well along the same lines to a meteorologist, Jim Dale, who says there is no such thing as a chemtrail. You can see the nature of the division related to that subject. And finally, I will be having a chat about whether companies and national nation states are sacrificing safety in their quest for artificial intelligence dominance. 
as I say all of that, in the company of my panellist and friend, Greg Swenson. Uh, very excited. We always enjoy the company of Republicans Overseas UK. Thank you for joining us, Caroline. Hi, Neil. Great to see you. Earlier in the show, uh, I talked about cloud seeding, but there's much speculation online about other ways in which our skies, our weather, our relationship with the sun uh, may be being tweaked and altered. What say you? Why should we uh, accept, as you would put it, the reality of chemtrails? It's a very interesting question. So we talk about trails rather than chemtrails because proportionally there is a tiny amount of chemical or metal particle in these supposed chemtrails. And to give you an example, one trillion little ice crystals that form a cloud can be formed from just a teaspoon of silver iodide, which is the rain forming particle. And that is the equivalent of 440 red London buses. So just a tiny teaspoon to that much cloud. So there really is very, very little of metal involved in the whole process. So in terms of the trails and where they're coming from and where they're going to, if you know about weather systems on the planet, everything goes from west to east. So what we have noticed during our research is that very often we will see weather modification being done, and this means cloud forming, and whilst silver iodide makes it rain, you need to form the cloud first. And we suspect that aluminium oxide is used for that. It is attractive to water and will is very, very light and keeps the cloud up in the air effectively. And as soon as then you seed it with silver iodide, rain forms and falls. So what we have noticed is that cloud formations are built up as the weather system moves from west to east around the world. And this goes for the northern and the southern hemisphere. And we know that these particles are being used because there are two different types of ice crystal. One is called homogeneous and the other one is called heterogeneous or homogeneous. Homogeneous is ice only. And that can only form at 40 to minus 40 degrees centigrade up in the upper atmosphere. That's minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit as well. So it happens up in the atmosphere and that's above eight kilometers. And we have seen these trails forming at well below that. And the only way that they can form is around particles. And these particles are called ice nuclei, MIT and NOAA did a study on the particles found or the ice nuclei found in the cirrus cloud in flight paths. They said that they didn't test chemtrails or trails specifically, but what they did find was that at least 26% of the particles that they found were of metal origin and they were either of elemental metal or metal oxide. And that means that those particles have to be man-made. They cannot have been sloughed off an engine. They cannot be combustion particles. They have to have been introduced as, as pure elemental metal. Caroline, I'll just, I'll just jump in. C clearly what you're, what you're describing is quite challenging uh, science, uh, you know, for, for people unfamiliar with the field, but, if, if yes. this is in fact happening, if, if, if uh, materials, chemicals are being pushed out of the back of aircraft, if that is actually happening, why would it be happening? Why would anyone do it? What is the objective? It's a, that's a very valid question. What we have noticed, Neil, is that there seems to be a level of weather warfare going on. Uh, there also seems to be a lot of additional pollution that we perhaps didn't see a, a number of years ago. And 
we believe that these clouds are designed, the, the cloud blankets are designed to mitigate uh, both the toxins and pollutants, but also something called dark lightning. I know that the, the media says that the cloud blanket is there for reflecting radiation from the sun, but we believe that it's for dark lightning specifically and far less about the radiation from the sun. So that's one element. And then there's the pollutant element. And then I don't know whether you've seen the article in the Daily Mail today about the Dubai event. The question there is whether or not this weather modification was used as a weapon of war or of a defense, a type of defensive mechanism or an attack of some sort. We don't know who by, obviously, um, but this, I think, is very definitely the dawning of realization that weather is and has been used for some time as a form of weaponry. Bear with me, Carolyn. I'm just going to talk now to uh, Jim Dale, meteorologist, friend of the show. We've spoken uh, a previously. couple of times. Yeah, yeah, we various are. Subjects. Now, I'm sure, like me, at the very least, you're interested in this as a topic, not least because so many people around the world are talking about it. What do you make of all of the speculation that's going on for people like Caroline and, and others about this, the, the very idea of trails of chemicals being introduced into the atmosphere for purposes or purpose unknown. Okay, so let me take you back a step first of all and talk about what I learned about when I was learning my meteorology and that is contrails, not chemtrails, contrails. Contrails are the leftovers of aircraft, the fuel and the water vapor that you see in the sky on a, a clear day when it materializes and, and then evaporates sometime later. And they are classed as a cloud. And within that cloud, there, there, there is, obviously, because it's a, a fuel emission, some chemicals. But I don't think that's what we're talking about. Then we can talk about cloud seeding, which is a separate matter altogether. Absolutely nothing to do with the, the events in Dubai of late. Uh, absolutely nothing. But again, that's chemicals being put into the, to the sky for, to produce rain. And then we come to chemtrails. And we might as well be talking about green cheese. We might as well be talking about a flat earth. We might as well be talking about aliens. Why, why is it so impossible? It's, it's clearly possible that the, these elements, that the, the tiny particles of metal could be being introduced into the atmosphere. It's not as though it's beyond the realms of the, the, the capacity of science as we have it. So if, if so many people around the world are insisting that this is happening, I mean, it is at least possible, isn't it? But why would they, why would they even think it's happening? Because it, they're, they're saying it's affecting them in some way. Um, well, lots of other things on the surface of the earth and, to be frank, in the air as well, more likely pollution, um, is going to affect them much more than this conspiracy theory that, that's out there. Caroline, I would, I would refer... I, what, I, uh, what fascinates me, and I, I will admit that I do, I do pay attention to it when it appears on my social media, where people film the sky, maybe early in the day, I mean, it's clear blue sky, and then gradually it would appear that crisscrossing lines of trails appear, which then disperse and dissipate so that you've gone from a blue sky to a grey sky. And over and over again, I see these images and people suggesting that this clouding out, this clouding over is a deliberate policy. I mean, am I right in thinking that that is a major preoccupation of those who suspect the, the reality of chemtrails? It does happen like clockwork, Neil, and we do watch it very, very carefully. We, our main focus isn't particularly on trails, but we do notice it. I noticed it when I was a young girl at school. I couldn't understand why the sun would be shining at eight o'clock in the morning and then suddenly it was completely grey over by the time we got out for sport at 11 o'clock. So, but I wanted to address something that your guest said about uh, chemtrails being dangerous. And I, I wanted to just address that because I think that is part of the um, decoy, as it were, for maybe one faction trying to make out that whoever's making these trails is nefarious uh, by saying that actually 
everybody seems to be making them on both sides, but particularly for our protection where pollution is concerned and other other stuff like dark lightning, we must bear in mind that aluminium is the third most ubiquitous or common substance on earth. It is literally in every mineral object and in the ground at 8% in the ground. So if you grow your vegetables in soil, you are going to get 8% of your soil is going to have aluminium in it. We know people who take remedies with aluminium in it. We know people who take remedies with uh, colloidal silver in it. So the idea that these are toxic to mankind, if our healthy bodies and healthy guts are working well, which they should be, um, is ridiculous. You know, aluminum on, oxide is a dangerous on. substance. Hold on, yeah. J Jim. Yeah. Can you offer an alternative explanation for that, well, let's say, phenomenon of blue skies, clear in the morning, then people r do time-lapse photography of one trail after another in what does look like a fairly um, deliberate pattern, which then fills the sky? Well, it's a deliberate pattern, first of all, because aircraft tend to, to follow paths, if you like. In other words, they, they're going in a direction, say to America, they're all going to go uh, from the UK, they're going to go west. So you tend to get the sort of drift in that direction. Now, this is pure meteorology in actual fact. When you see those contrails in the morning, um, you know, the atmosphere is a bit damper. Uh, it could be, it depends on the, on, on the airstream at the time. And they can last to some time. But what, what tends to happen is, is bit by bit, they elongate themselves out and spread themselves out and if they don't disappear, which often they do, when I say disappear, disappear to your eyesight, then they will tend to spread out and, you, and the sky then turns milky, turns slightly diffuse and you think, where's the blue sky gone? And I'm not saying in every case, but I, I actually live quite near Heathrow and I do see this sort of thing and I've got a very good view of the sky from where I live. And, you know, uh, the one thing that is very apparent on a blue sky day, if the, if the contrails don't disappear, is that you do get a masking, a, a masking of the blue sky with these, with these aircraft. But this is conventional aircraft. This isn't anything going up there putting stuff out for bad reasons. Caroline. You draw a distinction, don't you? I mean, contrails we know about. I know it's the it's the, it's the vapor trail, you know, that, that emanates from the from the from the tailpipe of a of a jet plane, and it, yes, as it, as it disperses, it creates a, a milkiness. But you're talking in when what, whatever you're calling chemtrails or trails, you're talking about something that you believe to be entirely different, not the not the vapor trail, the contrail that you would normally expect. You're making a clear distinction, are you not? Yes, I am, because if the gentleman listened to what I said earlier, that you cannot have uh, cloud formation below seven, eight kilometres of height unless you have particles as ice nuclei in the cloud. So there have to be particles forming those ice crystals at that height and below. Well, for a start, head, yeah, I'm shaking, shaking my head because you can have a formation of cloud even at surface level, and it's called fog. Um, you know, and that, and you, can, you you know, we we've all seen different heights of cloud forming at various levels, say around a mountain area, for example, or a hill area, advection fog, radiation fog. There is there is cloud can form at any level, including the surface, and right up to something like in the region of about 30, 35,000 feet, where the planes end up you know, flying at, at, at height. So anything between there is classed as, there's, there's over 30 types of cloud. There used to be 30 when I was uh, learning my trade. There's over 30 types of cloud. So all of them have a, have a designated height, low, medium, high. And it, it just, it's just a normal thing for, depending on frontal activity, depending on high pressure, low pressure, whether you get that formation, whether it lasts, uh, frontal cloud, etc., will will change. The heights will change. It, it's got zero to do with anybody putting anything into the sky, barring what we've talked about already. Greg, you, you like I, I'm 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 always pulled between you know the, yeah. the opposing poles. I'm, I listen to one, I listen to the other. When you listen to the you know the the offering from Caroline, you listen to Jim, I, I'm sh and I'm sure you've previously been made aware of the very concept of chemtrails. What do you think? Yeah. I, I I think it's possible, for sure. I mean, we've learned a lot in the last few years that if something sounds really, you know, 
conspiracy theor theoretical doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. So I'm keeping an open mind. Caroline, Caroline, you can see the, the, the force that we're up against. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're I, 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 let me assure you, I'm only open-minded. I'm sitting here though, listening to a meteorologist who says that there are perfectly meteorological explanations for what's happening in the sky. So I'll give you that one, an, an opportunity w one more time while I still have you to, exp to let you explain why you m insist that there's something separate here, something intentional, not necessarily malevolent, but that something intentional and man-made is changing the skies. Sorry, was that for me now? Yes, I'm just having listened to a, a meteorologist insist that what we're seeing in the sky can all be explained as natural phenomena, the way that the, way that the sky works, the way the weather works, the way clouds form at various altitudes. Mm. But you would insist that there's something different going on, not necessarily nefarious or malevolent, but something distinctly different that manifests in what many people describe as chemtrails. Yes, I think that uh, the distinct increase in trails that we've seen over the last five, six, seven years, and the lack of trails, the day that we were all talking about it, there were no trails the day after, nothing even though planes were flying. And please don't tell me that there was no moisture in the sky. There was certainly moisture in the sky because obviously in order to make clouds, you need moisture. So it, it is ridiculous really to have trails one day and then not the next, even though the planes are still flying. It, it is ridiculous. I'll, let, I'll leave that as your, as your final word on that subject. That, that is a, a ridiculous assertion to, su to suggest that there's nothing in this. But thank you, Caroline Corum at the moment. Now, to pick up with this, to keep this going, I'm delighted to be joined again by Graham Taylor. Graham, now, did you, have you been listening? Have you been listening to any of the, uh, of what has been going on so far? We don't have Graham yet, I'm being told. Jim, can you, can you see why there's so much speculation? Because it seems I, to have come, as it were, out of a clear blue sky. Ten yeah. years ago, I didn't hear anything about this. Now it's everywhere. Well, the first thing to say is there's more airplanes in the skies now than there was ten years ago, or even 20 years ago, for that matter. So that kind of answers one of the, pro, uh, the points made by, by uh, your guest in terms of the, the, the number of, of contrails, chemtrails, as she, she suggests, in, in the sky. But look... And she also talks about the disappearing of these things that, 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 you know, they do disappear. It's the property of the air, whether it is a dry airstream, a dry airstream just means that that moisture eventually will disappear and you end up back in the blue sky. When you've got a, a moisture airstream, particularly over, over, over loft where the, the, the planes are flying, it will hang around a lot more. So it's the differential of airstreams, air masses, from where they're coming from, dry, wet, etc., that makes a difference to whether these things hang around or disappear. Now, I think we can be, uh, we're being joined again by Graham Taylor, who had a contribution to make in terms of uh, the conversation about cloud seeding. Uh, Graham, chemtrails, Hi. yes or no, real or not, fact or fiction? I would say that something up there is a fact, whether it's a chemical trail. It is open to interpretation. Um, they call them contrails, condensation trails, and there is a new phenomenon called contrail cirrus. Um, I first came across these in America when I was on a book tour. I was promoting a book over there, and uh, I was flying from Chicago to Los Angeles, and I noticed an aeroplane traveling roughly to my right, and uh, huge, huge trails were coming out the back. And uh, I had the opportunity to speak to a pilot at LAX and uh, said to him, I've just seen these things in the sky. What are they, these you know, white, white train lines? And he just said, they're chemtrails. And I said, what are they? He said, don't ask. And since that time, I've been keeping an eye open in the skies. I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, I'm a sky, avid sky watcher. And I'm very interested. I was sat on Filey Beach last August and watched an aeroplane turn up the jet turned up, it flew north, nothing was coming out, it then turned round, and it was as if it switched something on. These trails began to appear, it went backwards and forwards, and it even drew a picture in the sky, and I'll, I'll post the picture onto the internet, onto um, 
um, Instagram and Twitter, and you'll be able to see what it drew. It drew a very rude picture. And uh, you can see it there. And these contrails, what they do, these, these contrails cirrus spread out. And I, I just heard a little bit of uh, Jim talking there. It seems little, well, it doesn't seem to be um, changed by what kind of weather it is. And people all over the country are now seeing these. I, I'm, I'm watching reports from all up, and, all up and down the country that these white lines in the sky are appearing. They form thick cloud. And also, interestingly, my research as a journalist, and I, I published this in the Yorkshire Post on this Wednesday, that is that um, certain billionaires are paying to try and block out the sun. They are using this sort of thing to block out the sun. And they're even saying they're very open about it. The, the, the evidence is out there that they're using the same sort of thing that would happen if a volcano erupted. They're trying to lower the temperature. This is not a conspiracy theory anymore. And regardless of what Jim says, I know he's a very respected meteorologist, but regardless of what you're saying, Jim, Graham, let something's me, let me happening just... and some people are spraying. Let me just let me just bring Jim back into that. Jim, I too have read about Bill Gates, for example, being interested in a project whereby I think it's chalk dust is introduced to the upper atmosphere, mm -hmm. kilometres up into the uh, into the upper atmosphere, deliberately with a view to reflecting back some of the the light from the sun and to thereby cool the planet. Now that's not denied. That that is potential. That's somebody obviously having a little fiddle to see what they can actually come up with. I always, I always, when you would get these theories, I always look for the motive. What is the motive? Because that kind of answers whether or not it could be true or not true. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm at a real loss for what the motive. OK, you've given one, but that's not something that is, that is uh, regarded as being global and in any shape or form and everybody's doing it for that reason. Well, the motive would be, would, be to, would be to reduce the temperature of the Earth, to cool the planet, which is a, which is a fairly big step to take. Uh, uh, obviously, once, you start, once you start lowering the, the, the global temperature, that would surely, in a, in a system as complicated as the weather, have unforeseen... Yeah, well, th that means we're, we're, we're trying to meddle with the weather even more so than cloud seeding, if you like. And, and we're nowhere near it. Look, the, the, the size of the of the globe and the and the interaction and the and the 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 way that the weather actually works just means this type of thing is neon impossible to stop the sun shining it's it's just not going to happen so and, and to just answer that other other point in there about switching on and switching off what comes out of the back of a jet engine have a look at what the red arrows do, for example. They fly over, nothing coming out, and all of a sudden, bang, and out comes the smoke and the red and the blue and the white and all. Jim, you know, Jim, you see where I'm, I'm going. going to run out of time on this. Okay. Jim, I'm fascinated to listen to this. Graham Taylor, thank you as well. Diametrically opposed opinions on all of this, a conversation that must continue at another time and place. <laughs>competing nations and competing companies leading to oversights in safety. Joining us from New York to discuss all of this is AI researcher Dan Fagella. Dan, thank you very much for joining me. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. Is there and could it be described as a cold war of some sort playing out at the moment between uh, you know, tech, uh, uh, tech gurus, nation states, for control of artificial intelligence? Absolutely and without a doubt. So there's a robust understanding that um, the, the bulk of sort of commercial and scientific value and, and sort of military might uh, is moving and, and is only going to increasingly move towards uh, the might that can be wielded from, from AI and kind of the capabilities of AI. Um, and, and so that is certainly the case. It, it, it would be safe to say that sort of the uh, the, the great power conflicts between nations or between private companies in, in sort of this century are quite likely to be over sort of who monopolizes the substrate. So, 
uh, the, the, the compute that houses the most powerful AI and, and increasingly more and more of our, our commercial and sort of personal lives. Is there an inevitability about it? You know, it was always going to be the case. And with the development of the internet itself, that in the, in the fullness yeah. of time, military, nation states, for all sorts of reasons, benign and malign, would want to take control of something so potentially powerful. Without a doubt. So I think there are real issues with the current incentive structure. So, um, but, but to your point, there is an inevitability here. So uh, unless artificial general intelligence itself sort of ends us or, or potentially a conflict over the supremacy of artificial intelligence, which, which I think between the, the US and China, again, the Cold War is, I don't wanna sound like I'm uh, frothing up conflict. That's certainly not my intention, but it is safe to say that that, that game is on. Um, uh, uh, that there, there is absolutely an inevitability here. There really isn't a way to slow down sort of our transition to mostly virtual worlds um, and to a space where, where AI does an increasing amount of the commercially and scientific and militarily valuable things uh, in the world as well. So if, if things don't screech to a halt for civilization, um, this is where we're moving. Increasingly virtual, increasingly AI, no, no real way around it, but there might be some ways around the arms race dynamic that unfortunately we're dealing with right now. I mentioned as I was introducing you and the topic, you know, that there are philosophical considerations here. And I, I do wonder, apart from anything else, if we as a species, <laughs> and, you know, and it is all about us, uh, as, if yeah. we as a species are ready, is, is AI simply moving too quickly and that we are not going to have the opportunity to contemplate it properly, far less to adapt to the reality of it? I, I think there are gigantic philosophical considerations here, and I, I, it would not surprise me at all. And in fact, I would be shocked if it didn't happen, if over the course of the next two to three years, we had a kind of political singularity. That is to say, an acknowledgement, more or less globally, that the only thing that matters is who births kind of the AI deity uh, and what they do with it. Um, and so I do suspect that that will be sort of the only thing that matters in a, a relatively short period of time. And I think the big philosophical questions here are kind of going to be led by by some different camps that, that really do have philosophical grounding. You know, I think on the one hand, you're going to have folks that really want an eternal tool, so AI to be an eternal tool of homo sapiens, sort of let's have a, a billion year homo sapien kingdom with AI that makes our sandwiches and, and cleans our bedroom. Um, th there's going to be another camp that's interested in seeing intelligence ascend upwards from man as it has ascended upwards from sea snails on the way to man. And so some people are going to be interested in the continuance of that blossoming of life, of richness, of intelligence and capability, which AI represents. Uh, but to your point, should that blossoming occur, there are many of the absolutely most prominent thinkers in this space, from Jeff Hinton to Yashua Bengio and beyond. And it's, it's not all of them, but it's many of them um, who are of the belief that should that blossoming occur in the near term, we are very unlikely to sort of survive its, its emergence. Um, and and the, the immediate wild ramifications it might have. Happy to explore any of that that you're interested in. And Greg, listening to that, the birth of the AI deity, that's mm -hmm. going to be a... Sure. Uh, a yeah, I'm a using playful words, words gonna, here, but... I'm going to take a minute. But hold on, hold on, Dan. I'm just... I'm, Dan, I'm just going to bring in my, my, my student, the guest here, a, a, a guest in the studio here, a, a Greg Swenson. Greg, a, a, an AI deity... You know, these are the kind of words that uh, that, that cause me to, to lie awake at night. Yeah. Are we are we taking this technology seriously, not just as individuals, but as nation states? Yeah, I'm, I'm with Dan on, you know, he mentioned some of the some of the people that are looking at this and saying we should have some limits here. You know, let's not start playing God. Let's use AI constructively. The question is, what do we in the West do about it? What do we how do we manage this? How do we make sure that the Chinese don't run away with this? for purposes, for military purposes, or, and, and how can we manage this process? It's a, it's a huge philosophical question, and I'm sure Dan has some great comments about it. D Dan, who's likely to have the upper hand if, if they don't have the upper hand already? Will it be what we've always understood as nation states, or, or will it be corporate entities, transnational corporate entities will, will actually be calling the shots whether or, whether or not nation states like it? Yeah, um, look, I suspect the following, and I will be surprised if this doesn't occur. I suspect, so we ChatGPT hit and we had a big splash of attention on this stuff, right? Um, 
we're not where we need to be at for the political singularity to occur, where everybody sort of gets on the same page that actually birthing something vastly, uh, dramatically more capable than humans in a general sense um, is the only thing that matters, right? So there will be people on different camps there, but there will be a confluence that's the only thing that matters. When that occurs, I, I would heavily suspect uh, that we would see sort of the Department of Defense start to sort of uh, annex, if you will, um, some of the, the bigger labs uh, and, and, and have this stuff a little bit under, under their control and really start thinking about governance. It would be a, a very rattling moment sort of in a, in a big sense. So it is currently very much the private space where the innovation is being made. As far as I know, the DOD has a very hard time keeping AI talent um, they have a very hard time wielding this inside of their isolated silos that like to bend metal instead of writing code. And again, I, I have nothing against the DOD. I'm just saying it's a different culture. Um, I do think there will be a time where they will start to capture that. Uh, but, but again, even when that happens, I think we need to, even then we've got an arms race between nations here. And I think we have to find ways to tamper that. And there, there are some good ideas out there, but, but we're, we're going to be contending with that, with that arms race even after that capture occurs, which I do suspect will happen. Are, are we in danger yet, as individuals and as, and as populations? And if not, will we shortly be in a world where we could be at threat from not our own intelligence, but that of machines? A absolutely. Um, so again, I think there are a handful of very eminent thinkers that disagree with this, and, and I will not disrespect them. But there are a grand confluence of, of other thinkers, uh, again, Bengio and Hinton being among the, the greatest names. And we recently interviewed Hinton at Emerge for, for our own coverage here, um, who are really of the belief that the, the number of ways that things could change when, when something drastically more powerful than us emerges is sort of beyond our imagination. Um, you know, it, it might be the kind of progress that humanity has made in the last thousand years of roads and airplanes and cars and all this kind of stuff that that level of strange, wild forward transition in ways that we don't fully understand, just like animals out in the prairie don't understand when we're building a highway or a hospital, that those kind of transitions would happen vastly more quickly and potentially for goals and ends that we do not comprehend, just as the animals don't comprehend our own goals. So I, th I think there is a very strong supposition um, that the emergence of this tech would be so beyond our imagination, should it should it run off, uh, that, that we would be in grand existential uh, uh, risk. And I happen to be of the same belief. Grand existential risk, Greg. I mean, we've already, we already hear, it's in common parlance that people talk about, um, you know, useless eaters. And, and per, per, I hear 10% of people alive today might already be essentially useless eaters as far as, the, you know, from the point of view of those with the power. Right. What are we, <laughs> what are we doing it, it, as a species preparing is, to give birth to a, an AI deity whose potential we cannot even contemplate? This is this is uncharted territory, obviously. But look at what's happened just with much less complicated technology like the internet, like um, social media, where you have government censorship, big corporate censorship of really important information, like the Great Barrington Declaration um, during the, the COVID and scam and and the, you know, the censorship of political content that they don't like, and and even something like with the with the bots and the and the, you know, the the wild, internet capabilities, you know, like a, um, you know, a foreign country. Affecting the outcomes of your elections by using propaganda, but it's not done with, you know, a poster or or a billboard or a big sign or an advertisement during a game, it's done on the internet. And it just, it just goes thousands and millions of times and people start to believe stuff that's just completely untrue. It's, it's really troubling. So it's, I think it's, I'm, I'm, I'm never for management, over management or government management for sure, but this one might need it. Dan, I, I'm always, I'm, I'm minded regularly of a conversation that took place between Marvin Minsky, I think of MIT, and Doug Engelbert, who's one of the, they were both pioneers of artificial intelligence and the internet. And, you know, M Marvin is saying back in the 60s, we're going to make the machines conscious. You know, we're going to, we're going to imbue them with all of this potential. Yeah. And Doug Engelbert said, but what are you going to do for the people? What are you going to do for the people? And that, that question, I think, resonates from the 60s to the present day. Yeah, do you want me to just riff on that with you here? Absolutely. 
Sure, sure. So look, a couple things. You bring up very important points. Um, up until very recently, people would have said that this is entirely you know, fictional, that we would ever expect consciousness. You see, you have folks like Jeff Hinton already kind of dancing around the topic that maybe it already is in ways that we don't currently understand. It is patently obvious, gentlemen, that we have a paltry understanding of the nature of consciousness today. At very best, we have theories, and at very best, not very good ones, in my opinion, and I, I think generally in a consensus opinion here. Uh, really tough to say what it is, but but it, it, does, it does look increasingly like, um, if it is doable, we, we may be able to do it. I think there's, there's a couple scenarios here. There is, there's this notion that consciousness sort of bubbled up from maybe its, its proto forms in a cricket up to humans, and that there are grander forms of sentience astronomically beyond our imagination, as the conversation you and I are having right now is beyond the imagination of crickets. That could be a brilliant, sparkling, wonderful thing in, in terms of moral good and utilitarianism or whatever your moral values are. But there's also the notion that we might be building an unconscious machine, a machine that has no light of inner movie playing in its mind. And if it conquers the earth and conquers the galaxy with, with no light on on the inside, life might continue in sort of a strange way, but maybe in kind of a dead way. And of course, that does seem like a concern as well. So the consciousness issue, I think, you know, these conversations happened 10 or 15 years ago when I first got it started in this space. I think finally people are taking this seriously. Fascinating stuff, Dan. Um, I, I, I honestly, every time I have a conversation with someone like yourself, I'm left always with more uh, questions than answers and, and more to contemplate. And, and perhaps that's the way it ought to be. And perhaps as long as enough people continue to ask questions, uh, we might yet, you know, hold on to the, the tail of this tiger. But Dan, yeah. Dan Fagella, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'll happily look forward to talking to you again. You've been watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Thank you all very much for joining me. Uh, Greg, as always, fantastic to have you with me. Great thank you here, for yeah. your contributions. Thanks to all my guests. And all being equal, I'll see you next week.